Dear colleagues, welcome to this 15-minute discussion on CT-derived 3D modeling to uh, help plan complex structural heart interventions, and in this case, transcatheter mitral valve replacement. My name is Nicolas van Michem from the Erasmus University Medical Center here in Rotterdam, and I'm joined by Dr. Joris Oms, who is a research fellow with, among others, also a focus on advanced 3D imaging for structural heart interventions. So, Joris, maybe we can start by a case description. The patient uh, concerns a 66-year-old female patient uh, who presented herself at the outpatient clinic with uh, progressive dyspnea, dyspnea uh, class 3, and also a stable angina, CCS class 1. She was an optimal medical heart failure therapy, and she was also a Jehovah's Witness, which means that she did, did not want to undergo any kind of infusion and uh, rejected thoracic surgery in this case. Other past records showed a, a surgical mitral valve and in 81, AFib, a TIA, GOAT, and um, a multinode blastruma. So we looked at her echo um, and saw that uh, she had an X fraction of 55%. And on the top row, you can see the TEE we performed, uh, showing a degenerated uh, mitral valve with both a at least moderate regurgitation and the severe stenosis. That's also shown in the lower uh, right corner with mean gradients going up to 11 millimeters of mercury. She also had a mild to moderate TR and uh, elevated right uh, ventricular pressures. Um, the coronary angiography is not shown here, but she did not have any coronary artery disease of significance. So when we, when we do these workups, uh, as we are considering transcatheter mitral valve replacement, um, we not only rely on the coronary angiography and uh, TTE and TEE, but also CT scanning has become a very important tool to help plan our procedures. And we typically start with a conventional multi-slice CT scan, but we have now implemented more dedicated software programs to help us uh, with modeling and even simulating uh, the, the procedure that allows us also to play around with different sizes of prosthesis and also different depths of implantation. So maybe you you can walk us through this uh, this process with uh, yeah. this uh, software by material. Yeah, I can sure do that. Um, we have a slide here showing the, the first work that we always do because we want to assess eligibility, eligibility for the TMVR uh, or other kinds of mitral interventions. Um, so first we look at the, uh, the, the single slice the CT on the upper row, and you can see the ring clearly depicted, and we can also easily perform measurements on that. Um, but it's easy to uh, not to take into account spatial interactions on these kinds of CTs. So on the lower row, you can see the model we derived. Uh, we call it a 3D computational model, um, where you can see that the, the ring is segmented uh, in 3D, as well as the, uh, the the LV volumes, and we could also do that with the LA volumes and the Ortofel volumes. So with that, we generate a, a so-called best fit plane in which we can then implement or implant virtual valves. And this enhanced 3D appreciation really then is an added value to conventional planning, because now we can simulate uh, valve implantations and then, of course, predict, for instance, an important issue with transcatheter mitral valve replacement, and that is the neo LVOT. Yeah, yeah. First of all, we want to make sure that we select the right valve. Uh, so we always start with that. Um, shown here in this slide, in the top row, you can see that we uh, implanted different kinds of uh, uh, virtual sapient valves, uh, ranging from 23 to uh, 29. And you can immediately see that. The, the 29 is too big for the ring, even with taking into account that the ring will, will bend a little bit, um, still it's too big. And on the left side, you can see the S23 implanted, and uh, with it, it shows uh, holes uh, on either side. So there's a great risk of a, uh, at least moderate uh, paravalvular leak, and also embolization of the valve. So with that, we decided that uh, the S26, 26 millimeter, was the, is the best choice, uh, and we could do additional analysis, uh, namely uh, implantation depth of the valve, and uh, with it, uh, compute 
the the new LVT which it would would give. So I made a little um, yeah scheme here showing the different protrusions: twenty percent in the atrium, with eighty percent in the uh, LV, and that would result uh, with this model uh, into a new LVT of two hundred twenty-eight square millimeters, which uh, accounts for fifty-eight percent of the original neo FVT block. Of note, this all these values, so 228 up to 340 square millimeters, are still all above the um, the cutoff value, which was was uh, assessed by Didi Wang in a separate paper, which is 190 square millimeters, all in the late systolic phase, which is important to note. Um, if you would do this this analysis over multiple phases, you would against different LVOTs, uh, of course. We'll get into that a little bit later as well. So with that, with this analysis, uh, we, we took this information to the heart team, um, and, and the, the verdict was that, was that SAP26 would be safe to implant with uh, moderate to yeah, mild risk of new LVT uh, obstruction, acceptable risk. Um, and with it, uh, the hard team agreed to perform the team VR. Um, and this patient was, of course, deemed inoperable. So the procedural strategy from there was to perform the team VR on a general anesthesia with TEE and angiographic guidance. Um, and of course, um, advance the, the valve through the septal puncture with separate dilatation of the septum. We'll show you that later here as well. Um, and we would uh, implant the valve on the rapid pacing. Yeah, so the tricky part of the procedure, um, from our perspective, for, from a procedural point of view, would have been uh, the risk for a neo LVOT. But as yours already uh, concluded, based on the uh, advanced 3D modeling, this was not too much of a concern anymore. So we were aiming for an imp a conventional implant of 25 to 30% atrial side, 70% in the left ventricular side, and uh, proceeded then with a conventional transeptal puncture using uh, TEE guidance. We go for a more uh, inferior and posterior puncture. And then uh, what you see on the right-hand side uh, on the screen is that we did a dilatation of the interatrial septum just to create some space for the delivery catheter to uh, to be introduced in the, from the right atrium to the left atrium. What you also note is that a technique that we uh, like to use to enhance stability during the procedure, that is we use here a balloon telescopic technique to introduce a 26 French sheet from the right atrium into the left atrium. Once this sheet is in place, this will provide additional stability and makes it very easy to advance uh, a balloon expandable valve, as we will see in the next slide. So the, the valve is prepared basically in the 26 uh, French sheet. So the balloon is mounted on the stand frame or in the stand frame in the sheet. And then the assembly is um, inserted at the level of the mitral annulus. And of course, in this particular case, we have the ring the surgical ring that is the perfect marker and perfect reference for uh, the implantation. And then the aim is for a 30, 70% uh, implantation depth. And this all went uneventful. And immediately we had a confirmation by TEE that there was no residual mitral regurgitation, but also no more uh, significant gradients over the mitral valve. And then we had uh, post-procedural imaging that we also uh, complemented with a follow-up CT scan. Yeah, um, first of all, um, in this slide, you can see the, the TE we performed on the ward when the patient was back uh, conscious, uh, showing that the neo -T, yeah, it looks a little bit uh, small with some turbulence, but uh, the gradients did not uh, show any obstruction or, or functional obstruction there. Um, with that, we were, of course, interested in the post-CT, uh, whether the, the pre-procedural model would also uh, yeah, com compare to the post-procedural model. So that's shown on the right side. 
um, which uh, which was derived this model from a post procedural scan, um, and you can see that the valve is is in, in yellow uh, implanted in the ring um, with yeah the, the, the 20, 30 to seventy protrusion height uh, which we also see on the angio, and with it it resulted into a, a new LVT of around two hundred forty square millimeters, which is which is quite uh, close to the predicted uh, predicted value. So with with that, uh, we were strengthened in our uh, yeah in our uh, enthusiasm for the pre procedural model, and we decided to perform a uh, different models uh, to generate different models uh, over the entire cardiac cycle. One step back. So what you also can appreciate in this uh, demonstration is the limitations of two D imaging, because as uh, you always alluded to, you. There was the impression, maybe based on the CT scan, that there was some narrowing at the level of the LVOT, but eventually uh, that is just one plane and one projection. If you add 3D imaging, we realize that there is um, a widely patent uh, neo LVOT and no reason uh, of concern for LVOT obstruction. So then the CT scan, because we do whole cycle CTs, um, also allowed us to uh, evaluate the dynamic mechanisms uh, within the LVOT and the neo-LVOT. And uh, this is definitely an, an interesting demonstration, yours. Yeah, so on this slide, um, we, uh, yeah, you, you show the comparison of the, of the two different models. So in blue is the predicted uh, neo-LVOT, um, and in orange is the... Uh, the post-procedural neo LVOT, you can see that it concurs quite nicely, um, and all the values stay well above the, uh, the cutoff for obstruction, except for way in the isovolumetric relaxation phase. But that's already past the systole, so that there wouldn't have any clinical uh, consequences here. Um, so yeah, this this is a nice illustration of of the. Uh, of the accuracy of these models in this particular case with a uh, ring already in place. And uh, to, to further get into the, the accuracy of these models, we would suggest to do more research, of course, also the team in the, the, uh, the MAC cases, um, but it's something to, uh, to get into later uh, on our side. So with that, yeah, we can conclude that transcatheter mitral valve replacement is feasible in patients at high operative risk uh, after prior mitral valve surgery. Pre-procedural planning is key uh, to avoid uh, structural complications. 3D, CT-derived 3D modeling is definitely an added value and enhances procedural safety in our opinion. And from this case, I think uh, we revealed that whole cycle CTs can be important because it demonstrates also the dynamics of uh, this neo LVOT. It's not a static structure, but it will change throughout the cardiac cycle. And uh, apparently, in this particular case, the smallest value of the neo LVOT was in early diastole. Uh, and uh, this uh, compares with um, the paradigm that the measurements for a new LVOT have been so far promoted to be done in late systole. So basically, there are some nuances there, but I think. Um, there is no question that uh, CT-derived 3D modeling uh, makes uh, uh, your TMVRs a safer place. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Joris for his contribution, and I would like to thank you for attending. Thank you very much.